On our last program, we introduced a study in the alphabetic design of Revelation chapter 3. And we covered the first nine verses and showed how they are typical of the first nine letters of the Hebrew alphabet. Gary Stern is here to discuss with me the alphabetic design of Revelation 3. J.R., to review just a little bit, uh, our studies have uh, proven to us that the Bible is laid out according to the design of the Hebrew alphabet. Twenty-two letters uh, in length, starting with Aleph, which is creation, and ending with Tav, which is truth and perfection. And they spell out the story of mankind's redemption. Well, it's very interesting that uh, in chapter 3 of Revelation, which has 22 verses, same number of verses, the number of letters in the Hebrew alphabet, we find this very outline. On our last uh, broadcast, J.R., we went up through uh, the letter Tet, ninth letter, ninth verse, uh, explaining how I at each juncture the meaning of the letter also spoke of what was happening to or a directive to uh, a particular church from the Lord. And let me mention before we get into our tenth verse that Jesus was the one who dictated these verses. And Gary, I have never seen any clearer alphabetic design than these 22 verses. That's very true. And it comes straight from the mouth of Jesus. So he is the, he is, he is the word, and he sure yeah. knows it from beginning to end, doesn't That's he? That's right. And uh, going back now and reviewing just a little bit, chapter 3 in Revelation uh, has the messages to three churches, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. And as J.R. and I uh, explained yesterday, these three churches are the church of the Reformation, the church of uh, the uh, uh, missionary movement going all the way up to the present day and the church of uh, apostasy, Laodicea. And uh, I'm going to read the 10th verse of Revelation 3, <clears throat> taking up where we left off yesterday. Uh, to Philadelphia, because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. What a great place this is to start, because this is the blessed hope. This is a great promise to the church. And it is an excellent example of the tenth letter of the Hebrew alphabet, Yut. Now, in my Texas accent in times past, I've called it Yot. Yes. Or Yod. But it's Yut, according to Hebrew scholars. And the meaning of the Yut is creation and the metaphysical. It stands for the hand of God. In fact, it is said by rabbinical uh, scholars that with the Yot, God, or the Yut, God created the world to come. With the hay, he created this world. So we do not see the Yut manifest in this world, but it is in the world to come. Gary, that's exactly what he's saying here. He says, I'm going to rapture you out of this world. I'm going to keep you from the hour of temptation which will come upon all the world. That's this creation. Mm -hmm. I'm taking you into a, another creation. And you know, uh, the, the letter you, the tenth letter, is the letter of uh, divinity. Uh, and <clears throat> J.R., when he says, because thou hast kept the word of my patience, uh, essentially, that is the word of Jesus himself, uh, the teachings of Jesus and the apostles. And I think this refers to the patience of the saints. In other words, if you'll keep my word for, for a little while, then I will keep you from the great test which is going to come upon all the world. Mm -hmm. And according to a rabbinical writing, Shabbos 104a, the yot represents an escalation to the height of spirituality. Gary, that sounds like rapture to me. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> now let's true. look at verse 11 and the kaf. <clears throat> okay. And the letter kaf, which is the letter uh, that uh, is the initial of the Hebrew word keter, which is crown. Behold, I come quickly, hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Bingo. <laughs> We've got it. I mean, how could it be any clearer? The cough represents crowning accomplishment, and that is exactly what the verse is talking about. Exactly. Wow. Crowning accomplishment, by the way, <clears throat> is uh, in its purest form the accomplishment of Jesus. When he came to earth, died on the cross, and received a name which is above all names. 
that is his crowning accomplishment. And you know, the rabbis say, and uh, you've got, um, you got to understand why we keep going back to rabbinical thought, because this is apart from Christian theology, but it certainly agrees with Christian yes. theology. They say that the, that the best crown is the crown of a good name. And you know, that goes right back to this verse again, doesn't it? Yes, it does. It <laughs> certainly does. Now let's look at the Lamed and verse 12. The Lamed is the letter of teaching and learning. Mm -hmm. Verse 12, him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out. And I will write upon him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. Hmm. Now, this verse fits the Lamed. The Lamed is the tallest of all of the letters of the Hebrew alphabet, standing right in the first like a servant lamp on the menorah, you know. Mm -hmm. it, uh, is a, it towers above the others in the center position, symbolizes the king of kings, the supreme ruler. And on one side of the Lamed is a Kaf, on the other side a Melech, and uh, Melech Lamed Kaf spells, or uh, Mem Lamed Kaf spells Melech, which means king. And so we have the royalty, first the crown in the Kaf, and then the uh, king. And Lamed, as J.R. mentioned, is uh, cognate to the Hebrew word Lamad, which is teaching and learning. And, and J.R., the great lesson here is that four times we find the word God used in verse 12, referring to the temple of God, referring to the name of God, the city of God, the new Jerusalem, and the new name. You know, it's interesting that there is a, uh, an enlarged Lamed in the word cast in the verse that tells us uh, the Lord rooted them out of their land in, in, in anger and in wrath and in great indignation and cast them into another land as it is this day. That's Deuteronomy 29, 28. And the Lamed here means that God cast them into another land to teach them a lesson. Mm -hmm. And so the rabbis have written that uh, whenever the Jewish people are found away from their original homeland, they are not there by chance. God put them there for a reason. Mm -hmm. And so the verse says, to he that overcometh, that is, you learn, he, the overcomer has learned the lesson of faithfulness. Absolutely. Basically. And then we go then to the final verse directed to Philadelphia, which is verse 13. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Now this uh, verse is represented by the 13th letter of the Hebrew alphabet, Mem, which in its open form means revelation. Mm -hmm. The revealed and then in the sophite form, the concealed, and the fascinating thing about this is the verse is repeated three times in this chapter. Once with the Vav, which represents God's connection to man, and here with the Mem, which represents man's connection to God, mm -hmm. our, our uh, ability to hear he that hath an ear, let him hear. And then the final one will be the Tav. Uh, it's what the Spirit saith, truth. And so it's, even though the verse, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith, uh, is mentioned three times, it shows the three different aspects of the letters that that make up the, this particular statement. That's fascinating, Gary. It is fascinating. And so we have gone from verse 7 to verse 13 in Philadelphia, represented by uh, seven Hebrew letters, starting with Zion, which is struggle, and ending with Mem, which is revelation. And now uh, we go to verse 14, uh, and this is the opening of the message to Laodicea. And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write these things, saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. And here we have the letter Nun representing this particular verse. Now, listen to the meanings of Nun. Faithfulness, soul, downfall, and emergence are rising again. Mm -hmm. And Gary, all four of these are in this verse. First of all, the faithfulness refers to deity. Now, uh, that's a meaning of the noon, faithfulness. And it's Jesus who is faithful. 
It says, um, these things saith the, amen, the faithful and true witness. Mm. So we have the word faithful here. Then there is the soul. Now, this is fascinating, Gary, because the soul here refers to that probing entity that God has placed within us. The Talmud teaches us about the soul. And when we return in just a moment, we'll share it with you. Don't go away. We'll be right back. There are several meanings to the word or to the letter noon. One of them is soul. And uh, the, the soul, according to the Talmud, um, is that which God has placed within us in order to probe our inner recesses. He says, on the day of judgment, the person's own soul will testify before God. God uses the soul to plumb the inner recesses of man's thoughts. And then uh, again, in the wisdom of the Hebrew alphabet, um, is this statement, man is accountable for his thoughts, words, and deeds because God has placed within his body a celestial light, his soul. Mm -hmm. And uh, Gary, this, this is basically what it's saying here. The church of the Laodiceans, these things saith the amen, the faithful and true witness. The soul is going to be the true witness. Absolutely. And, and by the way, your faith will ultimately be compared with the faith of the true witness. And your soul shall be a witness against you. Uh, we look at uh, uh, the rabbinic meanings of these letters precisely because they, get, they flesh out uh, the metaphors, the symbols, and so forth. Uh, not that we uh, espouse rabbinic uh, methods of interpretation as such. I'm going to be quick to say that, but because in these alphabetic designs, they they've had well, they've got two thousand, three thousand years on yeah, this. They're right on target. Well, Jesus is the one who wrote these verses. Absolutely. <laughs> and so uh, we're not espousing rabbinic teaching, but rather the word. Yeah. Now the big meaning of noon is downfall. And Gary, that's Laodicea to a T. It really is. You can't get any better than that. Downfall. Now, we come to downfall in the next verse. And by the way, J.R., uh, in the next few verses, we have a curious inversion of the face meaning of the verse. And this is because of noon. We are seeing the apostate, the apostate church. Absolutely. And so in... In these next uh, few letters and verses, we see not the thesis, but the antithesis exactly. of the meanings of these letters. All right. The next letter is Samic, verse 15. And Samic is the letter of support and protection, meaning that God uh, supports and, and surrounds his, uh, his beloved. And it says here, I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that thou wert cold or hot. Ooh, this is a, a, an indictment. Yeah. The very antithesis, or the opposite of, uh, support. Exactly. And uh, so here we have uh, Laodicea in its uh, worst form. And I want you to notice that an enlarged, double-sized psalmic is found in the Hebrew text of the writings of King Solomon, where he summarizes all of his teachings with the conclusion of the whole matter, Ecclesiastes 12, 13. Solomon concludes that it is the whole duty of man to fear God and keep his commandments. Well, this is exactly opposite of Laodicea. And speaking of opposite, I'm going to read the next two verses together, verses 16 and 17, which would ordinarily be characterized by the ayin, which is the eye, and the peh, which is the mouth. But we find here their meanings are flip-flopped, are reversed. So we have peh followed by ayin, peh the mouth, verse 16. Uh, so then, because thou art lukewarm, and neither hot, cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Verse 17, because thou sayest I am rich, increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and referring to the eye, and naked. Now, J.R., this is something we could talk about for a long time, the inversion of these two letters. Yes. Uh, we see this inversion in just a very few other places. Uh, particularly, I guess, the premier place would be the Book of Lamentations, where Jeremiah is lamenting over the destruction of Jerusalem. And in each one of those five chapters in Lamentations, the, the verses are alphabetic. In chapter 1, we see everything perfect. But when we come to chapter 2, 
we have the beginning of the disintegration of Jerusalem, mm -hmm. the destruction of Jerusalem. And it is shown by taking the iron and the pay verses and reversing them. Right. Exactly what we see here. And what you have, instead of the, the clear eye of discernment and the mouth proclaiming the Word of God, you have the weeping eye of disappointment. Or the blind eye. The blind eye that cannot see and the mouth that is stopped and stilled. Yes. And so you have the complete inversion of that which should be, and we right. find that here. Or the Laodicea. mouth of God that spews them out. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, I mean, this is really incredible. Here we see the same apostasy as we saw in Jerusalem in the days of Jeremiah. Absolutely. Since this is, and by the way, Laodicea is not a diversion. I mean, it's not just a little stump in the road. Laodicea is a big problem. Well, J.R., uh, it's been with us now for centuries uh, with uh, Western rationalism and with the rationalistic and socialistic movements of the 19th and 20th centuries. And, and essentially it involves uh, d a central denial of God. Uh, but we could go into that at great length. So we have in Lamentations five chapters. The uh, Chapter 1 is, is correct. The chapters 2, 3, 4, and 5 are disintegrating. Right. And we see the iron and the pay opposite in chapters 2, 3, and 4. And in chapter 5, there is no alphabetic design. And there is very ample precedent, therefore, for believing that what we see here in Revelation 3, 16, and 17 uh, means disintegration. We have this in other places in the Bible. Yes. So there's no accident in what we're seeing oh, no. here. This is, this is marvelous. And I wish we could spend a lot of time on this, but the clock is spinning, and we must go to verse 18, which is represented by Tzadi, the letter of righteousness, which says, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. Mm. If only they would repent, Gary. Yes. This is the antithesis of the meaning of Tzadi. Tzadi is uh, cognate with the Hebrew word tzaddik, which is the word for the righteous man. Mm -hmm. This is the exact opposite of that. But instead of just slamming uh, the Laodiceans and condemning them and saying, uh, you're a bunch of rash, you know, the wicked. The yeah, wicked. He's saying, take my advice. Buy of me that you might be rich. You know, this is an invitation to the wicked to repent and straighten up. Indeed. Now the next letter, verse 19, Kof, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous therefore and repent. Now, Jared, this letter, and the 19th letter, represents holiness. Uh, in its normal form. Holiness and growth cycles, and we have that, as he says, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Mm -hmm. You know, with the growth cycles, with uh, comes eventually holiness. In other words, the growth cycles are there to teach us holiness. And uh, this, this is shown in the hakafa, in the growth cycles. It's a developmental process as the individual uh, that uh, coincides eventually with the whole of history. And these cycles of growth are replete with rebuke and chastening until we finally leave this veil of tears and reach our greater glory. So why do the righteous suffer? Because God loves us. He's teaching us. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Verse and we, we are now now to just a few seconds, and the next verse is Resh, verse 20. Behold, I stand at the, at the door and knock, if any man hear my voice, and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. Resh, the letter of the yeah. wicked. And you know, in the Talmud, the rabbis say that if a man repents, we must accept him back. That's exactly what this verse is saying. Exactly. The next two verses, 21 and 22, the sheen and the tav, to him that overcometh, will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and have sat down with my Father in his throne. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. And the sheen, of course, represents God's provision, 
the Almighty God providing for us. And that's exactly what he says, to sit with him in his throne. Wow. wow. So he that hath an ear, let him hear, Gary, and that's the Tav. That's right, the Tav, truth and perfection. And the subject is what the Spirit says to the churches. And, the, and, and that which the Spirit is saying to the churches is truth and perfection. Uh, by faith, we believe that. Yeah, so there is no way these 22 verses in chapter 3 can be of man-made origin. It is the very statements of the Word of God Himself, Jesus, God-breathed message. We'll be back in just a moment. If you'd like to get the complete text of the last two programs on the alphabetic design of Revelation chapter 3, then just call the number at the bottom of your screen and ask for a complimentary copy of our January 2002 edition of Prophecy in the News magazine. And you can get the whole thing. And when you call, let me remind you again that we do have a new book out. It's called On the Eve of Adam, God's Ancient Plan for Lucifer's Defeat. It's $13.95 plus $3 shipping and handling. And if you order it from us, then it'll help us to maintain this television broadcast. Well, Gary, it's been an exciting program today. Very exciting program, and I would remind you that uh, our studies in print are always more detailed than we have time for here on television, so be sure to read them. And, of course, it's hard to follow the Hebrew alphabet, you know, <laughs> Yes, sometimes. it is. It's easier in print. Now, this is J.R. Church and Gary Stearman. Until next time, keep looking up. Prophecy in the News is a viewer-supported ministry sponsored by our many friends across America and in your area. For your gift of $10, you can receive a special edition of our current program on audio tape, or for a gift of $20, we'll send you our programs on videotape. For either order, call the 800 number on your screen right now. <laughs>